Hello everyone and welcome to our interview series at Maritime Innovations. Today I am at the DNV offices in Singapore and we are joined by Vukas Vovansky. He is the Regional Business Development Director for Southeast Asia, the Pacific and India at DNV. And with more than two decades across Maersk, Germanisch Lloyd and now 12 years at DNV, uh, Vukas has seen the industry from every angle, from vessel operations to commercial strategy, across some of the world's most dynamic maritime regions. He now leads DNV's commercial activities in Southeast Asia, working closely with ship owners to ensure their fleets operate with quality, efficiency and readiness for the regulatory and digital changes ahead. For fleet managers, sustainability leads and cyber specialists, this is a chance to hear where innovation in this region is moving fastest and which practical steps matter most in 2026. Vukas, welcome to our interview. Thank you very much, Joachim. Appreciate your time. Vukash, before we dive deeper, uh, let me start with a broad view. From your regional perspective in Southeast Asia, the Pacific and India, what major innovation trends are moving fastest right now? If we are to point to, let's say, three trends that we see here in, uh, in Southeast Asia, then definitely is the, the new fuels in practice. And uh, we have tested the concepts here of methanol bunkering, conversions to ammonia, biofuels, um, so definitely there's interest in um, alternative fuels as well as having ready ships to, uh, to burn these fuels uh, once the, the fuel becomes more um, available uh, as well as uh, uh, cost competitive. So this is definitely a trend that we see here. Uh, the second trend is everything related to data-driven operations. Uh, we see companies here uh, being on the forefront uh, of uh, setting up operation centers, uh, measuring their um, operational data, emissions data. Um, in Singapore, is, uh, we have the largest number of uh, ships uh, worldwide that um, uh, have uh, um, the DCS and MRV annual verification done by DNV. We also have uh, more than 1,500 vessels where our Emissions Connect uh, um, solution for data uh, reporting and verification is being utilized. So everything related to, to data and uh, controlling emissions data, measuring operation performance is very high on the agenda as the industry here is very progressive, uh, also supported by the, uh, the Singapore flag. And the third trend that we see, um, also driven by connectivity, as uh, uh, the Singapore government has committed to have 5G uh, network availability in the Singapore waters, is about the, the port ecosystem collaboration, as well as uh, enabling uh, a green and, uh, and sustainable uh, supply chains. That means uh, trying to connect the port, the, the ship, and verifiers like uh, like us at DNV to um, ensure um, emission reduction uh, overall, timely arrivals of ships, and uh, actually proper uh, uh, monitoring of data and where we as DNV bring trust. Innovation is clearly gaining speed here, but ship owners also face a lot of regulatory pressure. So I'm curious, with that regulatory pressure increasing, what decarbonization pathway do you see as the most realistic for ship owners preparing for 2026 and beyond? I think the regulatory topic is, uh, is the one that has preoccupied us a lot over the last weeks, particularly following the, uh, the IMO uh, voting on the delaying the, the net zero uh, framework. And we see two trends emerging. The first one is uh, related to efficiency first. So the, the best fuel is the fuel that you don't burn. And uh, we see continued interest in vessel retrofitting. Um, um, in our 2024 maritime forecast until 2050, we have identified there is potential uh, to save 16% of emissions by retrofitting uh, ships. As of now, we, we, have, we see that uh, there's an industrial um, uh, data that only one third of the global fleet has been retrofitted. So there's significant potential and we, we see ship owners sticking to their plans and, and uh, trying to retrofit as much as possible during the next uh, uh, special survey. And the second trend is being uh, flexible for the future fuels. So making the wise choices uh, to, um, to build ships, 
mm -hmm. uh, with dual fuel capability. Um, and uh, here the spectrum is quite wide. We see interest from ship owners here um, in LNG and methanol, which are definitely the dominant ones. But we also see um, a, a push for, um, uh, for ammonia, um, particularly uh, driven by those uh, ship owners with the highest focus on sustainability. In Singapore, we also have high concentration of large charterers, big mining companies, uh, or ag agricultural companies. These charters are also very active in driving uh, sustainability and driving innovative ship designs uh, as uh, emissions are very high on, on their agenda. Mm -hmm. And that leads to something many in our audience struggle with. If we may make it very practical, uh, if you had to narrow it down to three concrete steps, what should every fleet manager do today to stay compliant? So when it comes to fleet management companies. Uh, they are an extremely important group of clients uh, here in Singapore where we are working with multiple large uh, uh, managers. And when we speak to them, uh, and maybe we distinguish two topics first, the one on emissions and then the one on future compliance. Uh, in terms of emissions, of course, the transition, um, and particularly the EU uh, regulations, uh, uh, are requiring, requiring them to uh, be careful when it comes to contracting. The first advice would be uh, as they are the, the DOC uh, holders and have a, a legal responsibility for, for monitoring, monitoring and reporting emissions, uh, they have to have solid contracts with ship owners so that liability is not uh, mm -hmm. sitting on, 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 their, uh, on their side. Um, and then uh, we also would recommend uh, um, these managers to look at uh, cash flow per vessel. We see a lot of discussions about uh, emissions uh, on a ship and of course those trading to Europe right now, uh, they have um, the EU ETS uh, exposure uh, but they also need to comply with fuel EU maritime requirements and those innovative ships, those that are um, uh, ready to, uh, to burn alternative fuels, uh, they are actually having a, a surplus in the initial years and that surplus emissions can be utilized by pooling with other ships uh, and uh, there could be very interesting commercial um, um, arrangements. So we would encourage uh, these managers and owners to, uh, to consider uh, cash flow per ship and also we in DNV provide tools that allow them to pool um, emissions and, and, um, and bring in uh, other ships and, and explore and simulate how these pools look like. Uh, then a third topic that I've already touched upon is uh, continue to plan retrofits. Uh, think about uh, the next five years uh, and uh, what could be done uh, to, uh, to save fuel. And uh, then more broadly, it's not only about just the emission regulations. Uh, we are also uh, having changes on the statutory side. Uh, so. Uh, uh, for them to, to stay abreast of the developments, it's very important to utilize digital tools available. Um, we see strong interest in DNB compliance planner from our customers, and, and this compliance planner is basically enabling uh, owners and managers to understand all compliance requirements for that particular ship, uh, and then identify those outstanding jobs to be done, as well as give recommendations what, uh, what could be done. So uh, uh, we see a big challenge. It's, uh, you know, ship owners, managers have an overwhelming task these days to, to navigate uh, um, in the new regulatory uh, uh, world, but uh, we have tools uh, um, that can, can assist and uh, lead them along the way. Yeah, compliance is one part, but digital transformation is the other big challenge. From your experience, where does the NV see the biggest gaps in data quality and digital implementation, and how can these be bridged effectively? That's a very good question and um, we particularly see challenges with fragmented data um, um, as well as in general um, uh, poor data quality. There's still a, a topic that uh, we are working on with a lot of the um, uh, both large, mid-sized as well as small, uh, small ship owners and uh, we see um, also a challenge uh, with the ship and short data integration. Even though connectivity is, is more common, we see uh, a styling being increasingly introduced, 
um, but uh, we, we don't see uh, uh, good integration between uh, the ship and shore. And for us, the, the number one advice uh, to, um, to owners and managers is to uh, standardize how data is uh, uh, being uh, uh, collected. Uh, uh, and we have, um, we call it DNV, operational vessel uh, data is standard, which is an open industry standard that basically um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a schema that, uh, that indicates how data should be uh, reported. And uh, with, uh, with the, this standard is also uh, very commonly right now used with more than 40 different data uh, providers that we are working with. Um, as uh, we, we have access uh, to more than 50,000 ships uh, uh, worldwide when it comes to, if we combine those uh, data providers um, uh, with the ships uh, that they are, uh, they are covering. Um, so once we have the data, it's important to give assurance. Uh, we have uh, data verification engines that allows uh, for daily or you can say continuous uh, assurance of data and ident identifying errors and then uh, immediate correction. So uh, uh, once the data is in a way cleaned, um, uh, it's very important then to, um, to automate the, uh, the process uh, of um, uh, reporting. Mm -hmm. um, um, and uh, this is where uh, the whole um, discussion about uh, API uh, connection comes in, and, mm -hmm. uh, um, as well as uh, data sharing, because data is not only relevant for that particular ship owner or manager, but it's important for a number of stakeholders, including banks, including uh, charterers. Uh, uh, so uh, through our Emissions Connect solution, we are actually enabling uh, uh, that uh, to happen now for more than 6,000 6, ships. Yeah, and of course, none of this works with strong cyber resilience. When, when you look at vessels today, where are the most common cybersecurity weaknesses you still observe and what improvements should ship owners prioritize first? I think uh, cybersecurity is still not uh, considered as a big risk for our industry. Um, and we don't have cybersecurity embedded deeply in, in regulations or process, processes. Uh, uh, like, for example, when we look at the, the ISM. Um, so we see also a lack of standardization on ships mm -hmm. in, in general uh, when it comes to cyber security. Um, ship owners are operating uh, with different vessel designs with different configurations on board, which of course um, does not make it easy to, to standardize. So this is a big challenge. Uh, and we also see that uh, you know, the, the, govern, the governance side is not really keeping up pace with, uh, with a change that, we, that is happening in now. Uh, industry um, digitalization is accelerating, uh, remote operations are, are, are more common. Um, involvement of OEMs um, uh, on, on ships is, uh, is increasing. Uh, and with this uh, come risks. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the opportunities that uh, uh, increased connectivity uh, might bring uh, right now is not um, mirrored with uh, uh, proper risk uh, management and introducing uh, uh, the right uh, tools. Um, we as DNV have focused a lot on cybersecurity over the last uh, two years. We've done three acquisitions, uh, including Nixon in Finland, uh, Applied Risk in, in the Netherlands, as well as most recently in Singapore, uh, CyberAU. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of expertise uh, uh, in-house. And uh, I just want to refer to uh, one survey that was recently done by, by CyberAU here in Singapore, where they identified that only one in six ship owners understand what to expect of a new cyber secure vessel. And, um, only, and they also mentioned that um, it takes 57 days to resolve a cyber incident on average. Uh, uh, and in 75% of cases, the crew on board the ship needs to get involved. So these are complex cases. Uh, our industry is still maturing. Um, and we very much recommend that uh, we move from annual audits related to cybersecurity to continuous monitoring of the risks. And this is where also CyberAL, uh, the, the, the company uh, the, that we have more recently uh, uh, acquired, uh, is offering excellent service. Yeah. 
I mean, I've spent enough time in cybersecurity and uh, during my tenure in Microsoft, and I, I do understand that it can be hard for a ship owner or everybody uh, standing in front of such a huge vessel to appreciate it just could be seen as a floating IoT device that's very vulnerable. Yeah. And I think what many don't understand is if, you are, if you're on the tech, it might, might lead to a situation where you're not uh, allowed to enter a port and uh, to burst somewhere. So, uh, but I think this needs some time until, until ship owners, fleet manager, see the advantages of uh, using IT tools and then also taking the risks into account and taking care of them. Yeah. Before we wrap up, I'd love to get your perspective on the bigger picture, looking ahead. Which development do you believe will surprise the maritime industry the most in the next five years? So of course, you know, I wish I had a crystal ball, uh, but uh, thinking ahead, in my view, we will get surprised by the rapid adoption of um, uh, the low greenhouse gas fuels. Um, in my view, it will be partly driven by the regulation um, but also we see increasing push by the charters uh, with sustainability policies and we also see actually a push is more in the, in the consumer goods by the end consumer. So a consumer who demands goods on the shelves uh, mm. in different parts of the world to have a, um, um, an energy efficiency tag and they want goods to be ship, shipped in a very environmental friendly way. So that, that's why I think the, uh, the adoption of these uh, low greenhouse gas fuels will surprise us uh, as at times we, we are still a little bit in disbelief if these fuels will come, how, much, how costly they will be. Um, but this uh, uh, is something that I would expect. Uh, on top, I feel that we will be moving into a more um, uh, autonomous shipping. Uh, we will not have uh, fully autonomous shipping in uh, international trade. But uh, the digitalization, um, uh, increased connectivity will enable more autonomous shipping, more remote uh, uh, yeah. operations. And as we are in Singapore and uh, we are in Asia, I feel that Asia will continue to grow. Asia will be the place where, where shipping mm -hmm. will, uh, will thrive. And, uh, um, and that's where a lot of opportunities uh, will be. I also have, uh, so maybe part of the prediction, I have one wish. I wish that safety becomes uh, uh, the much bigger concern of our industry and that companies uh, utilize a lot of the technological tools that are available today to uh, focus more on safety, um, utilize uh, sensor-based technologies, uh, utilize uh, picture recognition technologies uh, um, as well as the large language models to, to help us uh, automate a lot of uh, processes to, to help also our surveyors on board to be more supported by actual data coming from ships related to ship condition. Um, and this is the area where uh, as a, there's a lot of sharing um, uh, happening between our customers and it's also an area where um, no one is willing to compete on. Um, uh, so safety um, first mm. and this is where also DNV will stand by our clients. Uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing these insights. It's great to speak with you here in Singapore and I really appreciate the clarity you brought to these topics. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Akim.